Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi, Roger. Hello, Frank. Hello, Frank. Thanks for, for joining me on this podcast, um, video podcast. Um, I wanted to, to start to ask you um, about music and the way people have used music in this sort of lockdown period. We've seen people uh, singing on their balconies. We've seen people banging you know, pots and pans um, uh, outside applauding health workers. We've seen professional musicians releasing music online. Um, in a way, do you think music can be a source of um, of solace, or, or in a way, a way to self medicate even? And I don't know who wants to start. Brian wants to start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, music is a good art for this because it's a it's by definition a sort of communal activity. So it's something that is normally done by people together, sometimes done solo, but most often it's done by groups <laughs> of people. So it's, it's a much better art for doing that than, for example, say, painting or poetry, which is usually done by individuals. So, so it's a good... We're, we're used to the idea of people getting together to do music together. And um, I think that it's a sort of sign that people make to each other that, first of all, they're friendly, they're OK, they're not dying. You know, music is the thing that people do when they're in very dire circumstances to show that they're still there and they're still alive. And I think that's partly what this is about in the COVID <clears throat> era, that people are just trying to say, we're still okay and we're still together. And of course, it's a sign of companionship as well. So it's, um, it's actually very welcome in England. You know, we had five years of extremely bitter politics um, with Brexit and so on. And I almost think that this COVID thing has been an invitation to people to actually be nice to each other again, <laughs> and they're enjoying it. Roger, I'm really yeah. glad, you, I'm very glad to hear those words of um, co compassion and wisdom and optimism from my friend Brian. <laughs> I, you know, like music's always there, obviously, whatever's going on, and it is very much a two-edged sword so um you know you you can stick it on um triumph of the will uh, as part of you know the propaganda of the third reich in the third, or we can use it as as all the suxley's so to lull us all into feeling that everything's probably all right anyway and that normal is all right and so on and so forth so but i but equally i think music is capable um, you know, because of our shared neurology of, of touching whatever we might call our heart um, in ways that encourage us to empathize with others. So, um, so Brian's absolutely right uh, uh, about that. My concern is that it is, a, it is used far more often and maybe far more effectively to persuade us that we should go on accepting the status quo and you know and not take to the streets mm. and not have the revolution and not do anything about it and go back to normal going back to normal is the worst possible thing that could happen to the world at the moment in the wake of this yes in my view yes and uh, i th i think um adding to that you know there's this kind of assumption among a lot of artists that music is automatically good that just being bathed in music is kind of good for you and it will make you a better person whatever mm. political situation and that clearly isn't true music is a powerful weapon and it can be used on either side you know it's not it doesn't automatically produce good results if it did then uh, people like himmler who were great opera fans would have been wonderful people uh, <coughs> didn't work for them or wagner himself dare one say mm. yes. i mean yeah let's not go there but I, I wanted to, uh, to, to comment on what, on what you've both said, and, and Brian in particular, when you mentioned that, uh, you know, during COVID, music brought me, people together in a, an, an, even, an, an even stronger way that, than, than usual. And, and I think we might have all felt that. I mean, like singing on, on your balconies, whatever, clapping hands, saying hello to the neighbor you've never said hello to before. But 
what what is important is, is for is for this to continue right and because you know when things go back to normal we might lose what we might have gained during those two months and the question is how we can do that build this sense of community among uh, among others right well i don't think things will ever go back to normal i i really think they won't now the danger of course is that they could go back to quite a lot worse because we now have very effective and um, apparently socially acceptable surveillance systems so we can all be looked at watched carefully so but normal is not an option i think i just don't <clears throat> see how we can ever go back to that and and i think at least for the next um, five years there there are going to be economic consequences that will be used as an excuse for all sorts of um uh lockdowns of the mind actually and uh, i'm i'm quite worried about that but normal is not on the table as an option i think i couldn't agree with brian more i mean normal is rampant neoliberal capitalism gone completely crazy and now the power because of neoliberal capitalism has devolved into the hands of 0.001% of the population who are immensely wealthy and everybody else can't make the payments in any way. There's no way to live in the world because Zuckerberg and Bezos have got all the money under their fucking bed on some island somewhere and they're not going to release it and allow it to grease the wheels of society or create a better world or what. They're, they're using it to fulfill the prophecy of Armageddon and the end of the world. They are using it to destroy the planet, which is ours, and all the other species on the planet. But it's not there oh. to do with what they will. The days of raping the planet for profit are clearly an anachronism that we should have shrugged off several hundred years ago, and we failed to. And my concern about <coughs> music as a tool of the propaganda machine, as a tool of the Ministry of Information, as a tool of Big Brother, is that it is being used to perpetuate the system. Because these fuckers don't care that they're destroying the world. They don't care. They couldn't care less. They, they, they are entirely encapsulated in this tiny bubble of profit, 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 profit. And that's it. And they will not brook any interference with the model, even though a small child can see all over the world children are tugging at their mother's sleeves, going, Mummy, mummy, the emperor's got no clothes. What the fuck is going on? Why are they just why are they killing us? Why, why, why do we live in a state of perpetual war? Why? Because they can make money out of it. Stop tugging my sleeve. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's Oh, it's obvious, but is there anything to be done about it? You know what? You were talking earlier, Frank, about parts and pounds, the Casarolazo um, protests, in which I came across first through talking to friends in Santiago in Chile, but I've seen it in, in many other places now in, in South America. This is one of the positive things of um, is, is social media. The fact that we have video cameras may be, may be um, disproportionately negative effect upon our lives, but it does have this effect. You can point it at a policeman, okay? You can point it at your neighbours all with their pots and pans, leaning out, out of the windows, standing on their balconies, protesting. It, otherwise, we would never see this because the only reports we would get from San Diego or from Quito or from Rio or from all the, or, or from Lebanon or from Beirut or from any, or, you know, or from Israel or, would be via the conduit of the mainstream media, who never tell us the truth ever about anything. They are there. Their function is to make up stories to divert us from ever seeing what's really going on or what the reality of our lives. So this, this little, you know, this iPhone thing is hugely, hugely important. I've, I use mine more and more now to make tiny messages for people. And they're like, I try and keep them less than two minutes so they'll fit on Twitter. The last one I made was because some people in a, 
in in Villa Thirty One in in um, uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina had had there's a paper there called uh, Garganta Poderosa and they they'd said there's a lady here who's just died of coronavirus in this I don't know what Spanish for favela favela is but anyway there and uh, she had been writing to the authorities rem- relentlessly asking for water because they say oh wash your hands everybody what are you talking about we don't have any water we do not have, how can we wash our hands we haven't got any water so i tagged my little my little video water is a human right and of course it is but of course it isn't because they sell it to us they collect rainwater and sell it to us and it's called evian or whatever it might be called but this is our water that is being sold and if we can't afford it we go thirsty and we certainly don't have any left over to sing happy birthday while we're washing our hands five times a day <laughs> so so ramona medina we will not forget you that was the lady's name yeah. but what's interesting is that i don't know how many views this little thing has had Two or three hundred thousand, or something like that. So there's two or three hundred thousand people who would never heard of this woman or her mm. one in protest in this favela in Argentina, and now they have, and it spreads, you know, and it yeah. spreads, and that's great. But it's our know. only Frank is our only way, it is our only conduit to the world. Frank and RT, they're the only people who will speak to me. <laughs> And and, um, <laughs> and it, it's good. No, it's good to be able to talk to people. You know, we we really should spend our lives down the pub talking to each other, which is something people <laughs> used to do. They did, and they don't do that anymore. Pubs mm. are. I don't know what they are anymore, but they're certainly not that. They used to be the hub of the community, mm. and you would go, and there were certain class you know, discrepancies. It would be the lounge bar where the posh people drank gin and tonic and the public bar where you had a pint mild. Or better if you were feeling like pushing the boat out. I don't know. But so <clears throat> thank goodness for Frank and for social media and for being able to actually speak to one another about things. I, 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 uh, I want you to say, I mean, in a way we... We go, we're going around in circles, right? Because what you said, Roger, is true. You can get a, a short video getting 200,000 views if you, Roger Waters or Brian, you know, I guess. Um, so maybe 200,000 people will see the video and we will uh, hear about something they didn't know before, the, you know, the, the water in, in Latin America, etc. But then is that, how do you turn these people that have been touched by this two-minute video in a way into activist and into a movement right and i think that's the question i mean as activists and stuff we've worked on for we've we've tried to sort out for years right how do you actually create a, a massive popular movement i'm not asking well, I think, an sorry i i think um i think that's something that grows quite slowly and it grows when the climate of information changes you know when when i remember this there's this great book about the end of the Soviet Union called Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. And the writer of that book says that revolutions always happen in two stages. He says the first stage is when everybody realizes something is wrong. But the second stage and the important stage is when everybody realizes that everybody else realizes that as well. So so then you kind of get a gelling effect where suddenly we all realize we agree about this thing <clears throat> we're all on the same side and so i think i think this this long term process of constantly putting out your messages and <clears throat> having these kinds of discussions on social media if you like but other ways as well um they create the climate where a revolution can happen quite quickly the interesting thing about the soviet union was that it happened overnight you know from one day to the next there was a complete change and i think these things can happen very quickly if there has been a lot of this prior conditioning going on yeah. if everybody is kind of ready for it you know you don't have to explain to everybody because we've all been reading those social media posts and so on and so on 
So I think it can happen quicker than we think. You need a system, though, that's capable of producing a Mikhail Gorbachev in order to facilitate the tipping point, because you're talking really about the 100 monkeys. You're talking about the tipping point when suddenly it spills over into... And and it, and it tipping point... There was a book about it, I can't remember, but it's a fascinating idea, as you, which is what you're talking about. You're saying suddenly you get that magic number and it's like you develop herd immunity to the yeah. point. And you, you become immune to the propaganda that perpetual war and killing people for profit and, you know, um, your navy and armed forces murderously swarming over the world, killing people for money is not right. And that it doesn't make you happy. Mm -hmm. you know, are you happy? Are you, are you happy in the United States of America? Are um, the American people who are at heart are good people and industrious and cosmopolitan and at least have a constitution and so on? So, no, they're not. They're not happy. They're fucking miserable. Mm. And so, so I hope, uh, yeah, so let's hope that um, we can do ev every small act that pushes us towards the tipping point is a good act. Yeah, but it needs nudges from as many of us as yeah. possible in order to. Yeah, you're right. That's right. It's a it's a long and rather quiet process until it suddenly takes fruit. Yeah, well, you might not notice it happening for a long time. Yeah, and in a way, um, as as artist, uh, I, I want to read you a quote by um, political activist Angela Davis. Um, who said that artists are the ones who guide us towards the future, allow us to experience what we are not yet able to conceptually articulate. <coughs> artists allow us to imagine the possibilities of a better world. So in a way, I mean, do you agree with that? Do you think artists can? Because sometimes, sometimes politically, the, the lack of vision is what blocks people. Right? We, we think about the Palestine movement, for example, because from the leadership, the Palestinian Authority, there's no political vision. People are wondering, but wh what are we fighting for, right? So do you think artists can actually sometimes open this window or this vision? Well, I think, if I may intercede here, I think what artists do anyway is create worlds. They can be great big worlds, like complicated, constructions like 1984 or Brave New World or those kinds of worlds, or they can be tiny little worlds like a pop song or an earring or something like that. But the, all of those things are invitations to you to see what does this feel like? What does this world feel like? So they don't only produce good worlds, they produce bad ones as well, because you want to know what those feel like too. What does 1984 feel like? Is that where you would like to live? Probably not, so you better do something about it then. Um, but yes, I think, I think what Angela Davis located there is the very job of being an artist. It's to create other worlds for people to have the experience of being in another world and to look at their own world from a different point of view, change their perspective. Um, the, this is not generally understood, which is why it's possible in England to have an education system that says that art is not very important. What we have to learn is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And art is a kind of a little luxury that we throw in at the end if you're lucky. Whereas in, in my opinion, it's very clear that art is the way in which we experiment in how we feel about other ways of being. It's, it's a very important way of understanding things. Over to Roger. Sorry, I, I should say Roger and out, shouldn't I, each time I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, my God. Uh, talk about opening a Pandora's box, really. <laughs> um, if we start going down the rabbit hole of talking about what art is, um, we really should go down the pub first. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. But anyway, um, yeah, the problem. The, the, I I hear what Angela says, and of course, and of course, she's right. Or wouldn't it be good if she was right? And of course, yeah. she is right. But 
I get snippets of art from Vijay Prashad all the time because he sends me his um, uh, Tricontinental Institute newsletters uh, whenever he writes one, and he's written 30 or this year already. So, And there are nearly always in them snippets of art, bits of art, paintings, poems, not so much music, but paintings and poems, normally featuring pictures of heroes from workers' revolutions or from people who, you know. And, uh, and what I've taken from that is, why don't I know about these people? <laughs> Look at this amazing painting. Who's this guy? Oh, he's some Polish bloke who died in 1928 or something. But I've never seen the work. I don't know. So it, art gets very quickly um, processed in the machine. Like we do, Brian, by yeah. the record industry, you know, like when I wrote Welcome to the Machine all those years ago in, the, in 1975 or something, I was, I was in a pop group and I, rec I was recognising that we're just fucking fodder, you know, they don't give a shit about any of this. What they care about is never paying a black artist a single cent of royalty. And that, if they do that for the whole day, that's a job well done. I shouldn't be tarring them all with the same brush, but there is, a, and so it's very easy to go, oh, what can we do with this? Oh, it's a bit hot. Oh, let's cool it down. Let's put a plastic coating around it, right? And uh, let's put a bikini on it and make it twerk. And then everything will be all right because nobody will ever think about anything again except bums. You know, Kim Kardashian's bum actually is the perfect. I know we're drifting into the realm of idolatry, here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's a perfect example of how can you subvert a conscious human being into becoming involved with something that's completely facile and meaningless and, and a total waste of their time, like Facebook, right? Well, quite easily is the answer to that. That's the whole idea of reality TV. When you were talking about normal, I nearly quoted, I'm going to quote it here now, a bit from one of the songs on my last album, and it goes, every time some, uh, so every time, every time, um, the curtain falls on some forgotten foreign life, it is because we all stood by silent and indifferent. It's normal. Mm. Normality is to stand by silent and indifferent. In terms of Israel, Palestine, Brian and I, and Thurston Moore, you know, and Wolf Alice, we are the exceptions to the general rule that it's normal. Mm. Nick Cave and Radiohead and the Rolling Stones and Paul McCartney and Elton John and blah, 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 blah. The list is endless. Go, what the fuck are you talking about? What's wrong? We're musicians. No, you're not. You're human beings and you have a responsibility to stand up for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Brick, do it. Have I gone? I can't hear you. Actually, no, sorry, it's me. I'll hear you. I, I want to, actually, I want to ask you something about that. We talked about the role of artists, uh, yeah. but why, I mean, you two have worked with many artists, including some really well-known ones, uh, that are potentially very, you know, their heart in, is potentially in a very good place. Um, but why, I mean, not only on, I mean, Palestine is really like the litmus, litmus test, right? But why do you think there are so li little of them that speak out um, uh, on, like on Palestine, but on other is issues as well? I mean, I know you both have been in touch with many artists around the Palestine issue what's what's the the block right because they probably know well, it's different it's depends who you are we're, we're all in very different situations where i live in the united states um the israeli lobby is extremely powerful less powerful now because of the work being done by you and others in bds and even the stuff we did with the russell tribunal all those years ago so so their power is lessening thank goodness oh, mm -hmm. so that's so that so that's one thing musicians White, white musicians. Yeah. You know, in, in America, there's this thing called a PEP, which is progressive except for Palestine. Well, that, that is the thin end of our very nasty, thick wedge. Because if you don't say, if Palestinians don't, uh, are not allowed human rights, 
then nobody is. Why, why would you care about the Rwandans or the Tibetans or the, you know, or, the, or whoever those people are in, you know, in China, the Muslims or what, or anybody anywhere, or the whole of the population of Latin America? Or the whole population of the United States. Why would you care about their rights? Why, the, the, you know, the descendants of slaves. Another black man in 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 uh, one of the southern in Kansas, I think, was choked to death by four guys two days ago. They just choked him to death and murdered him in broad daylight. Nothing's happened. They've been fired. No judicial proceedings have been started against them. The jogger who they shot to death with shotguns following him down the road and then killed him you know obviously that iceberg it's not just the tip showing that iceberg sits on this country the endemic white supremacist bullshit of american exceptionalism sits and racism sits on top of everything choking the life out of it and making it almost impossible for we human beings to collaborate with one another, <coughs> transcending our color or our religion or whatever else it might be. Because these fuckers are trying to build up the bricks of these um, things that prevent us from acting together. Like religion, right. for instance, constantly, all day. I know I'm rambling, sorry. No, 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 because I wanted to, um, you mentioned the US and, uh, <laughs> and, and obviously we know who's, who's in, in power in the US. But I mean, look at the UK. I mean, you're both British, but Brian, you live in the UK. Um, it looks like Boris Johnson's government is in a very bad posture, right? Because of Boris Johnson's response to the crisis and now the, the problem with Andrew Cummings. But Don't I mean, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure many people in their heart feel that they will get away with it because they've, you know, they've gotten away with it many, many, many times before. So why do you think they get away with it? And do you think this time, for example, in, in, in the UK, where I think the, the, the level of death has been the highest in, in Europe mm. and it's not over yet, um, do you think there's a chance or do you feel that there's the, the premises of, of something happening? Unfortunately, Jeremy Corbyn is not the leader of the Labour Party <laughs> anymore, but what do you think? Well, what, what I think is that given that 85% of the media are still owned by a few billionaires who have very strong and monolithic opinions about this and who will support the government till the, di till the end, I think um, we can't expect a quick change anyway. Um, I wanted to go back to your, if you don't mind me, just going back to your previous question about artists. Um, there are two answers to it. One of them is that a lot of people just think, fuck it, I'm not going to be bothered. I'm just going to get on with my life. It's inconvenient. And if it involves Israel and Palestine, it's nearly always bad for your career. Um, you know, because you get, you get labeled anti-Semitic, whatever your position was. Um, but there is, there is one other exception, which is that some artists honestly do believe something that I don't believe which is that art is automatically good, and therefore the best thing they can do is to carry on making it, not to get involved in politics, but just to keep making art. And that in itself, they think, will contribute positively to the situation. Um, so I, I've been having this argument quite a lot over the last few years because that is kind of the argument that people give for not supporting BDS. They say, but you're withholding art, this magical, wonderful thing, from the people that you're trying to change. That can't work. Um, so I think we have to sort of start thinking about art in a, in a different way. Sorry to get back to that topic you didn't want to talk about. That was, no, that was important. And, and I think it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's spot on because you, you have the, yeah, both aspect of, not wanting to hurt the career or just hurt the, the PR aspect of it, right? Having to answer emails and emails. <laughs> of, but um, you, Brian, and, and you even more so, Roger, um, get this all the time, right? We, I posted the video of our conversation, Roger, about a month ago now. Um, there's lots of positive comments on YouTube, but there's always loads of the same comments. Roger, you're an artist. Shut the fuck up. Sing 
you know, play guitar, don't come and talk about Palestine. And that's, again, going back to, are you an artist first? Like, you know, are you, are you a musician that is political or are you actually a, a citizen first that, that's making music? Um, and, I mean, Ken Loach talks about this uh, very well. You know, he says, I'm a citizen first and I make films, but I'm a citizen, you know. What, playing bright, well, Ken, bright. Obviously, Ken is... You know, Ken, of course, would say something wise because he's a very wise man and he's very important to, to all of us, my generation and successive generations, I have no doubt. But the answer, could, obviously, to the trolls, or, why don't you shut the fuck up and you're an artist, shut the fuck up. No, you're not an artist. You shut the fuck up. Fuck off. Why are you wasting everybody's time posting this shit? It's none of your business. How dare you suggest that you might have an influence on what I do with my life? I care about my brothers and sisters all over the world, and I care about my art. I say, how dare you? You're a nobody, and you'll always be a nobody because you're a bigot, and you're a nasty little slimy bigot. So shut up, and please don't ever write into my <laughs> whatever Facebook page or whatever thing it is again because you're so dull all right of course we must have our say and 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 of course some artists will go oh, i don't care about the palestinians fine but that's because they're citizens first and as citizens they don't care if if they did then as artists they would be doing something about it but they don't and rolling stones don't care about human rights what are you what the, they go are you insane of course i don't I care about the money. They're quite open. They're, at least they're honest. At least they don't pretend like other people I could mention, you know, that they're somehow solving the problem, you know. No, you're not, Nick Cave. <laughs> Brian, do you want to... I, I can't remember the question now, was, uh, but, um, you know, you want to... Uh, well... Yeah. Come on, yes, you're the I good cop. <laughs> I I do believe that you could I do believe that you could honorably choose not to take a political position or not to contribute to that discussion and uh, not and it wouldn't be because you're a coward necessarily now I think of course in that particular situation Israel Palestine there are lots of factors involved because they pay a vast amount of money if you go and play there so of course, we're all polite people, so we never talk about the money as though that isn't a factor in anyone's thinking. But, you know, if you're going to get a million dollars for a show, that's a lot of money. And um, that's sort of what they're paying, I think, at the moment. And so, but let's leave that out. Let's say that that is not a factor in anyone's thinking. And I keep trying to say that there are people who honorably believe that they are doing the best thing for that situation by not making political comments about it. That is not my position at all. I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. But it's their position because they believe that just art sort of poured onto a situation like uh, some magical syrup will make everything better, that people will be improved automatically by art. And I always say to them, well, the biggest art collector of the 20th century was Himmler. He had a huge collection of paintings, ancient, uh, older Flemish and Dutch paintings, which were mostly stolen from Jews. Did Himmler turn out to be a very enlightened being sitting in the middle of this huge collection of art? It doesn't necessarily make you into a good person to be exposed to art. And, and I think this is, we, we always talk about art as though it's this magical stuff and uh, we, we must never criticize that it can't be bad. But nothing that's powerful is only good. Anything that's powerful is dangerous. And art is part of that as well. I, I want to, um, to end, in a way, by asking you again about how to create change. Uh, Brian, you are one of the founder of... Um, a political movement, DM25, or the Democracy in Europe Movement 2025. Uh, uh, Roger, while incredibly 
active and vocal politically, you are not directly anyway affiliated with a, a party or a movement. So first, Brian, do you think that building a movement or a political party while operating in a broken and just and democratic uh, capitalist, capitalist system can make a real difference? And then, Roger, I'd like to hear your, your response to that. Uh, okay, yes, I, I actually believe that one should operate both inside and outside the system. The, the system exists, you know, a big system exists. It's called the EU, for example. It's called the United Nations. It's the World Health Organization. There's a whole infrastructure of legal systems by which we do settle some disputes and we do create legislation that is sometimes good. Um, Remember that legislation is the expression of a kind of consensus that people have arrived at. So it has power because, um, because it has lasting power. You know, you can set something in law and then it continues for a very long time. So it's, it's powerful stuff, legislation. This is why the, I'm interested in uh, the application of law to environmental circumstances as well. Um, of course, when the system is severely broken, like you now have in America, more than even in England, where the Supreme Court is now stuffed with sympathizers of Trump, then really the system doesn't work any longer. They're going to be there for a very long time, and they will consistently vote in a prejudicial way. So there, I think... This is why I think there will be civil war in America, because I don't really see that there's any path left for, for a kind of non-revolutionary shift to any new values. It's blocked. The walls have been built, you know. So um, I think in England we could still, we can still do it. Um, as you said, it looks like the Conservative Party is in kind of meltdown. I hope it is. Um, that might lead to something else. It's a pity Corbyn's not here, <laughs> but but any change will be better than this. <laughs> so Roger and I hope. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeremy Corbyn, where are you, brother, when we need you? I wish you'd kind of, never mind, it doesn't matter what I wish because it's over, you're no longer in town. This new guy frightens the life out of me. I've forgotten his name, Starmer. Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer. Wow. I've heard his pronunciations on Israel and Palestine. Yeah. It is scary beyond all belief. Um, I wish you were right, Brian, particularly in the case of uh, the UK, that the legislation produces law and that we abide by it. The minute you kind of say that, one, I think about Julian banged up in Belmarsh, and with the latest hearing about to start, I believe, and unless something happens, they willy-nilly will extradite him to the United States where, they, where the Americans will kill him. That's going, and that is yeah. completely illegal and against all the laws of the land. That is at the behest of Boris Johnson's masters in Washington. You just tell him what to do and he'll do it. So Boris Johnson ain't gonna stand up and say, no, we need, we, need to, we need to abide by the laws that have been handed down to us through the legislative bodies that we call government in the U UK. So, and this extrapolates from the microcosm of the UK in, into, uh, into the broader model, which is the global thing. We always have to remember when you talk about the United Nations and so on and so forth, which was the spawn of the League of Nations and, <clears throat> and the Treaty of Rome and the setting up of international law and, you know, and the International Criminal Court and the blah, blah, blah in The Hague and co international courts of justice and blah, blah, blah. They have no power. The, the United States of America, which has got gunboats in, in the estuaries of every river in the world, they never subscribe to them. They're not signatories to any of the treaties that have to do with anything that might be considered a consensus of the rule of international law. This is why they can glibly and blithely talk about annexing the Wex Bank. It's totally illegal, completely against the Geneva Conventions, all 
you know all this, so I'm preaching to the choir, I know. But so, yeah, I mean, if you could entrench yourself deeply enough into a Labour Party that could gain power, or in any other party in the UK, and could actually produce a society where the law meant something and where everybody had recourse to it, even if it's an Australian journalist who was doing his job and exposed war crimes to which we, the people of England, were party, that would be fantastic. I bang on, I bang on about Magna Carta. I get up before I have my cornflakes. I normally recite Article 29. You know, habeas corpus, I've been banging on about on stage for year after year after year after year. And yeah, people like Mr. Troll waggle their finger at me, go, mm, just sing your songs. You know. Fuck you, I care about habeas corpus. Just imagine if you were being held under administrative detention, you know? In, in Palestine or Egypt or, and yeah, and I'm getting to you, Celine. Trust me, me and Frank. Anyway, all right, that, that sort of so yeah, the rule of law and the, and the and the would be would be a wonderful thing to institute. And you're so right about the Supreme Court. It's scary. They're mm. really scary. It's really looking scary. For end time. Well, they want end times. We now have a Supreme Court in the United States that is slathering for the end of times. Mm -hmm. It's going to be Jesus, Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, and then the whole of the Supreme Court, all holding hands in their fucking robes as they drift off into heaven, leaving the rest of us to eternal damnation in the flames <laughs> of hell. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd rather be in hell, frankly. Imagine having <laughs> eternity with Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo and Jesus. That, that's going to be the title of the interview. I'd rather be in hell. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I tell you what, this is, this is, for me, this is as good as going down the pub. You know, because I like you guys a lot. And, uh, I w yeah, I wish we were down the pub. But this is... <laughs> Uh, so there's nothing that wrong with Zoom. It, Apparently, uh, Zoom steals your, your data in a big way. I mean, that's what I've heard. But Does it? I mean, oh, they all do, right? But yeah, I was all. reading articles about Zoom being quite bad at protecting our data. Oh, of course they will but, be, yeah. Mm. No, they're part of the machine. But, yeah. you know, at a certain point, you have to stand in your padded cell and yeah. worm your way free and give the fucking camera the finger, you know, because... Mm. That's, that's what you have to do. Yeah. You have to keep doing that over and over and over again. Or join the Labour Party with Ken Loach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not putting Ken down, by the no, way. No. You know, he's a huge hero of mine, as you know. You fight until, until the end. Yeah. And anyway, um, that was lovely. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, guys, sorry. But thanks a lot, Brian. Thanks a lot, Roger. That was... Uh, very nice and interesting obviously um so yeah i'm gonna stop the recording now okay, okay.